I have a story about the perplexing disappearance of the Westerfield brothers. Typically, adults are trusted to safeguard children, but suspicions arise about one caretaker's intention. Picture a seemingly innocent movie outing, possibly a narrative as a screen to something more sinister. Could one individual be behind the brothers completely vanishing? Let's get into this investigative journey together and uncover the truth. Join me for a ride through Strange and Mysterious, here at Odd Mysteries Stories. Let's begin by learning a bit of a tangled tale about Margie and her unexpected love triangle. So, Margie was just 18, fresh and young, when she crossed paths with Carl Bach at the Fort Bragg Post Exchange. He was a decade her senior, but she found his gentlemanly ways quite charming. Yet, Margie never saw sparks fly with Bach to her. He was more like a protective older brother than a potential beau. Now, enter Thomas Westerfield, also known as Mel Westerfield, another soldier in the picture, and things start to get interesting. Margie and Mel hit it off pretty quickly, spending their dates cruising to Rockingham to catch up with Margie's mom. You know, just your typical love story unfolding. But here's the twist. Margie was keeping her budding romance with Mel a secret from Bach. Or so she thought. The action thickens when Margie borrows Bach's camera for a day out with Mel, snapping away memories. But, oops. She returns the camera, completely forgetting the film inside. Bach curious as anyone would be, gets the film developed and uncovers the secret. Yep, Margie and Mel are clearly more than just friends. Caught in the act, you might say Margie was definitely busted. Despite the revelation, she continued to juggle both relationships. She dated Westerfield while maintaining a sibling-like bond with Bach, under the impression that Bach had no romantic feelings for her. But Margie's life was anything but simple. Getting married young, she found herself in a complicated web involving Mel, the boy's biological father, and her second husband, Carl Bach. Sounds like a soap opera, doesn't it? So what do you think? Was Margie just trying to keep everyone happy, or was she stuck in an impossible situation? How do you navigate a life where your heart pulls you in one direction and kindness in another? This is just the beginning into the story of Margie and the missing Westerfield brothers. All right, let's march into the next chapter of this intriguing story, and trust me, it gets even more interesting. Meet Carl Bach, a man with a history that reads like a novel. His journey to the United States began when his family left Germany for a new life. Fast forward a bit, and we find Carl enlisting in the army in 1945. But it wasn't all smooth sailing early on. Carl found himself in hot water, charged with a crime. The details are a bit murky, but whispers suggest it was either robbery or assault. The consequence? Time in Leavenworth, the daunting federal prison in Kansas. However, Carl's story takes a twist. He was offered a choice, stay behind bars or return to active duty. Opting for the latter, Carl was released, became a military police officer, and was eventually stationed at Fort Bragg. Now, here's where things get a bit romantic, or complicated, depending on how you look at it. During his relationship with Margie, Carl took a secretive trip to New York City, came back, and surprised Margie with an engagement ring. Despite accepting it, Margie didn't put a pause on her relationship with Mel Westerfield. But as fate would have it, the Army had other plans for Carl reassigning him shortly after his proposal. Margie was left in the dark about his new location, but Carl didn't let that stop him from keeping in touch. He sent letters to Margie, but here's the catch. They were sent to her mother's address in Rockingham. Her mother, taking liberties, read his letters, and, believe it or not, discarded them. Meanwhile, Mel Westerfield, the other man in Margie's life, was also in the picture, sending letters to the same address. Unlike Carl's, Mel's letters found their way to Margie. So, with an engagement ring on her finger and letters from two men vying for her affection, Margie's life was nothing short of a love story with a twist. What was she thinking? Holding on to that ring while still entertaining another suitor? And what about those discarded letters? Could they have changed the course of this tangled tale? Stick around as this story is far from over.
Fast forward about 18 months after Margie and Westerfield's paths first crossed, they decided to tie the knot in Bennettsville, South Carolina. It wasn't long before their family started to grow, with the arrival of their son Terry just a year after their wedding bells rang. Life seemed to be on a pretty steady path for the couple, but as we all know, life has a way of throwing curveballs. About four years into their marriage, Westerfield received orders to transfer to Germany. Margie and Terry packed up their lives and joined him, embracing the adventure of living overseas. It was during this time that Margie discovered she was pregnant with their second child, Alan. The family of three was about to become four. However, not all stories have a fairy tale ending. After spending three years in Germany, the Westerfield family returned to Fort Bragg. It wasn't long after their return that Margie and Westerfield's marriage came to an end. But remember Karl Bach? Margie's story with him wasn't finished. After her marriage to Westerfield ended, Margie, now a single mother of two, rekindled her relationship with Bach. It turns out, life had more in store for Margie and Carl than just a brotherly friendship and a forgotten engagement ring. The two eventually decided to get married, starting a new chapter in Margie's life. So, there you have it, a story of love, transitions, and new beginnings. Margie's journey from a young woman caught between two soldiers to a mother and wife navigating the complexities of life is nothing short of remarkable. What do you think comes next in the life of Margie and her new family with Karl Bach? On a seemingly peaceful Saturday morning, September 12, 1964, the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, was bathed in sunlight, misleading many about the weather's true temperament. Little did the residents know, the remnants of Hurricane Dora, which had hit Florida two days prior, were barreling through Georgia, poised to bring heavy rain and wind to their doorstep by nightfall. In the midst of this, Terry, an 11-year-old with red hair and freckles, and his younger brother Alan, aged seven, started their day in the comfort of their home on Madison Avenue. Their mother, Margie, who had become accustomed to working outside the home, a rarity for the era, was at her job at a local beauty salon. The boys, having recently experienced the departure of Karl Bach, their soon-to-be ex-stepfather and their mother's latest separation, found solace in the routine of watching television and then later playing outside. Margie, maintaining her role as a provider, had left her children under the watchful eye of a babysitter named Barbara Temple, acknowledging the necessity of her work despite the family's recent disruptions. The morning passed as Terry and Alan, bonded by their closeness despite the age gap, ventured outside to blend playtime with the neighborhood kids, imitating cowboys and Indians near the railroad tracks. However, the normalcy of their Saturday took a turn with the unexpected arrival of Carl Bach around 11 a.m. at the family home. The purpose of his visit remained unclear, especially since Margie had not been informed of his plans to be there. The dynamics within the house shifted as the neighborhood children, oblivious to the underlying family tensions, knocked on the door asking if Terry's could come back out for more outdoor adventures. They were met by a stern Carl who told them as a punishment he was going to keep Terry indoors, a story obviously believed by the unsuspecting friend. The narrative took a darker turn when Bach, asserting his will, confronted Barbara Temple, the boy's guardian for the day. Despite her instincts telling her to stay until Margie's return, she was forced into leaving early, relinquishing the boy's care to Bach, a decision shrouded in unease and uncertainty. As the day progressed, Alan was last seen riding his bike around 1 p.m. before he too disappeared into the confines of their home. The once lively atmosphere turned eerily quiet, marking a foreboding silence as Fayetteville braced for the storm's indirect yet impending assault. The day took a pivotal turn around 4.40 p.m. when a neighbor spotted Karl Bach leaving the family home. He returned shortly after, claiming he had taken Terry and Alan to the Broadway theater for a double feature evening. The films on show were called No Name on the Bullet, a western starring Audie Murphy, paired with The Atomic Man, a dive into science fiction. Margie, returning from a long day at work at 5.30 p.m., found Carl at the house. He informed her that the boys were at the theater watching movies, perhaps 
hoping for a quiet evening that could mend their strained relationship. However, Margie was far from pleased. Their conversation quickly escalated into an argument, fueled by Carl's decisions to send the babysitter home early and take the boys out without her consent. Frustrated and seeking relief, Margie changed her clothes and left for an evening at the NCO club on Pope Air Force Base, a recent regular escape with a girlfriend. The evening wore on, and at about 7, 45 p.m., Carl headed to the theater to pick up Terry and Alan. He parked in a no-parking zone, positioning himself for a clear view of the theater exit, anticipating the end of the boys' movie night. Time ticked slowly by as he sat waiting, but the doors opened and closed with no sign of Terry or Alan. As the clock neared 9.30 p.m. with still no sight of his stepsons, Carl assumed that perhaps Margie had picked them up earlier. With this thought, he drove back to the empty house on Madison Avenue to wait, the silence of the night echoing the growing uncertainty of the boy's whereabouts. The night continued to unfold with distressing turns for Margie. Returning home around 1 a.m., she was met not by the comforting sight of her sons, Terry and Alan, but by Carl alone and the bearer of unsettling news. Their conversation quickly escalated into another argument, this time fueled by the absence of the boys and the day's missteps. Carl's admission that he had not found the boys after the movie sent Margie into a state of panic. By 2 a.m., her fear had peaked, leading her to call the police amidst a backdrop of a storm that had unleashed its fury on Fayetteville flooding streets and disrupting power and communication. The Fayetteville police responded to the urgent call, driving Margie through the tempest-tossed town to the Broadway theater. The theater's manager met them, unlocking the doors in the slim hope that the boys might have been accidentally locked inside after falling asleep. But the building gave up no secrets. The boys were nowhere to be found. Dawn broke with no sign of Terry or Alan, deepening the mystery and the worry. Thoughts turned to the boys' biological father, Tom Westerfield, speculating whether he might have taken them unexpectedly. Despite the slim chances, Margie clung to the hope that this was just a surprise visit gone unannounced, a scenario that, while implausible, offered a sliver of comfort that her sons were safe. However, this flicker of hope was extinguished when investigators contacted Tom at his base in South Carolina. His assurance that he had not seen the boys corroborated by a solid alibi shattered the last of Margie's strained optimism. The confirmation that her sons were not with their father was a devastating blow to her already fragile state. Overwhelmed by fear, uncertainty, and a mother's worst nightmare unfolding before her, Margie spiraled into shock. The culmination of the night's harrowing events and the relentless worry for her missing children were too much to bear. She was subsequently admitted to the psychiatric ward of Womack Army Hospital, where she would spend the following two weeks, a testament to the profound impact of the boy's disappearance on her mental and emotional well-being. As Margie grappled with her overwhelming distress in the hospital, unable to piece together the events leading to her son's disappearance, the focus of the investigation shifted towards Karl Bach his status as the last known person to have seen Terry and Alan placed him squarely under the detective's lens, a suspicion magnified by the ongoing separation from their mother. The police interrogated Carl multiple times, yet his account remained steadfast. He claimed to have dropped the boys at the Broadway theater at around 4.40 p.m. on the day they vanished. Despite his consistent narrative, the absence of tangible leads and the boys' tender ages prompted the FBI to join the search, indicating the serious nature of the potential abduction. In a bid to gather clues, authorities issued a public plea, urging anyone with information about the disappearance to step forward. However, the community's response was dishearteningly sparse. It seemed as though no one had witnessed anything unusual on that fateful day. The detectives hit a wall their efforts thwarted not only by the lack of eyewitnesses, but also by the relentless storm that erased potential tracks and flooded the region, obliterating any physical evidence that might have led to the boys. Compounding the investigative challenges, the Broadway Theater, a popular haunt for the Westerfield children, 
lacked surveillance capabilities to confirm whether Terry and Alan had even arrived there, as Carl had asserted. The absence of footage left a gaping hole in verifying his account. Yet, the theater staff, familiar with the boys, particularly Terry with his distinctive red hair, failed to corroborate Carl's story. None of the employees, not even Judy Moore, who was romantically involved with Carl at the time, reported seeing the boys that evening. They also said that Bach didn't talk to any employees there during the two hours that he said he had waited for the boys, and that Bach didn't enter the theater. This unanimous lack of acknowledgement from the theater employees deepened the mystery. If Terry and Alan hadn't been at the theater as Carl claimed, it cast a shadow of doubt over his entire narrative, complicating the case further and leaving investigators scrambling for the truth. Carl Bach emerged as the sole suspect. Throughout the investigation, he exhibited a notable lack of cooperation and detachment, often referring to Terry and Alan impersonally as them boys or the boys rather than by their name. This cold demeanor did nothing but fuel the suspicions against him. The boy's biological father, Mel Westerfield, was shattered by their disappearance. He devoted nearly 14 years to an exhaustive and heart-wrenching search for his sons, a quest that ended tragically with his suicide in 1978, leaving the mystery of his son's fate unresolved. The marital bond between Carl and Margie could not withstand the strain of suspicion and heartache. They divorced while the investigation was still active. Margie moved on to remarry, seeking some semblance of normalcy after the unfathomable loss of her children. Carl, too, moved on, marrying Judy Moore, whom he was involved with at the time of the boy's disappearance. Despite the cloud of suspicion that hung over Bach, the investigation into Terry and Alan's disappearance ultimately reached a standstill. No new leads emerged, and the case grew cold, leaving a haunting void in the lives of all involved. The bodies of the boys were never found, and the absence of concrete evidence left law enforcement powerless to make an arrest. The consensus among detectives and family members alike pointed accusingly at Karl Bach, convinced that he played a role in the tragic outcome. They speculated that the boys had met their end well before the supposed movie outing. Yet, Without physical evidence to substantiate these beliefs, the legal system's hands were tied. If Bach was indeed responsible, he had managed to meticulously erase any traces of the crime, leaving the truth buried in the shadows of that fateful day. In the year 2000, the cold case surrounding the disappearance of the Westerfield brothers saw renewed interest when retired investigator Alex Thompson and Mark Brewington, an agent from the State Bureau of Investigation's Cold Case Task Force, decided to confront Carl Bach. By then, Bach was living a quiet life in Eleanor, West Virginia, nestled along the curve of the Kanaha River, and had reached the age of approximately 80. His reception of the investigators was anything but warm. According to Thompson, Bach was reluctant to engage, yet seemed unable to resist gauging what the investigators had uncovered, alternating between offering outdated information and maintaining silence, a strategy to test their knowledge depth. The persistence of the case led to another confrontation in 2012. This time, Fayetteville Police Detective Mike Ballard and Thompson traveled to Tama, Wisconsin, to interview Bach again. Despite the years and the gravity of the situation, Bach remained indifferent about the fate of Terry and Alan. Throughout the conversation, he coldly referred to them as them boys, a dehumanizing term that stripped the missing children of their identities and underscored his emotional detachment. This lack of empathy and refusal to use their names were noted with concern by the investigators as Bach had exhibited this same behavior in previous interviews. During this intense session, Ballard, having read the case file and interviewed Bach before, made him an offer. I approached him with the possibility of a letter of qualified immunity, telling him, all we are interested in is finding these boys, Ballard said. He looked at us and said, I was in the MPs, the military police, and if I hadn't been in the MPs, that would be a pretty good proposition. Ballard took that to mean that Bach thought he was smarter than to accept such a deal. The conversation took a significant turn when Bach let slip a statement that, to the experienced Ballard, sounded like an inadvertent confession, you know I was the last one to see them alive. In the world of criminal investigation, 
Such an admission can weigh heavily, nearly equivalent to a confession, especially when coming from the prime suspect. Despite these chilling interactions and the shadow of suspicion that hung over him until the end, Karl Bach passed away on May 9, 2016, in Tama, at the age of 93. He left this world as a man buried with military honors, taking with him any secrets he held about the fate of Terry and Alan Westerfield. Margie remarried and lived much of the remainder of her life in Loris, South Carolina. Over the years, Margie never gave up hope that her boys would be found. In a 1994 interview with The Observer, she told a reporter that she liked to think her sons were still alive. There's always a part of you that wants to believe they are still alive somewhere, she said. I hope and pray that they will be found alive, but that's only a hope. Sometimes I don't think God will let me die without knowing what happened to my children. Margie died on February 27, 2003, in Florence, South Carolina, at the age of 70. There you have the story of the Westerfield boys. Do you think it's possible that they're still alive somewhere as Margie died believing? Or do you think that Karl Bach went to his grave with a secret that he never revealed in detail? I'd like to add one more detail before ending this story and welcoming your comments below. I'm told that the woods surrounding Fort Bragg are incredibly dense and there are areas of those woods that few people venture into and if Karl Bach brought the boys back into those dense woods, they might never be found. Now I invite you to share your comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video and are enjoying the videos on my channel. My name is Vince, and if possible, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting new videos each Monday and Friday. Clicking the little bell will send you a notification when a new video is posted. In the meantime, I invite you to watch one of my other videos on your screen. Thank you.